What's going on, everyone? I'm just a typical, average American here today to finish up reacting and learning about the worst natural disaster in Canadian history, the ice storm of 1998. This has been a roller coaster of emotions, uh, mostly negative emotions, to be perfectly honest, with some positivity in here as well. You know, mostly around the, the Canadian response to this, the resolve and the helpfulness of, and problem solving with a lot of this stuff. Um, if you've been following along, I've re this is a documentary I'm watching on the ice storm of 1998 and how it hit a very narrow part of Canada. Well, not, not that small, it affected a lot of people. Um, and just the sheer craziness of visually seeing this level of icy uh, natural disaster. The narrator was saying that the place was becoming entombed in ice, which is not an exaggeration. Five days so far of trying to survive without power. We learned that after a few days with zero heating and electricity, you can have serious medical and health concerns staying at home. Uh, Canadians were helping each other, coming up with shelters and how to feed the community. It was beautiful in a way, but obviously this whole travesty is uh, quite extreme, um, honestly. So in that respect, I have enjoyed learning about it and, you know, learning from it. So it's been quite something. And uh, when we left off last time in part two, gosh, it was day four or five. And honestly, it was, it's like the biggest cliffhanger ever. Although I did end up seeing, we did end up seeing like what happened where all of the power uh, going to Montreal was connected by five or six main power lines from different parts of Canada. Like, all but one power line was out of commission. And the last one was teetering on the brink of collapse, literally. Icy collapse and destruction. So uh, they decided to get a helicopter out there, take matters into their own hands, drop a log on the power line to shake off the ice. I thought it was madness. It was actually brilliance. It worked. And we're going to pick up here. The storm is the icy part of the storm is basically over. It's still snowing like all hell. And uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, finally wrapping this up. As the sun rises, Montreal breathes a collective sigh of relief. Whew. The remaining power lines were saved and much needed power slowly returns to the city. Okay. Ron, can you give us the good news we've been waiting for? Ah, Deborah, there is good news tonight. Oh. Dear friends at home, we can tell you we can now bring closure to the worst ice storm on record. The changeover has taken place. We've got light flurries falling in the greater Montreal area. As for ice, forget <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> I appreciate a sense of humor about these things. I like him tossing away the ice. Um, but now, you know... <laughs> It's about dealing with the death and destruction that was left behind by this. Almost equal or worse than the actual event itself, I imagine, was the aftermath. Now that it's finally over, it's not really over. After the big freeze, the big thaw. Ah! Ahead, the long... Oh, the big thaw. Oh, it's... It's like they're taking revenge on the storm, getting their chainsaws out and cutting it down. But seriously, it looks like a lot of trees were damaged. And ice is still falling randomly from, like, buildings. It's, it's like, dangerous. Long process of recovery and cleaning up. This window of decent weather may be very small. It's supposed to get colder and colder over the next few days. Uh. So you can imagine what went on here today. A huge effort to make the most of this opportunity. To oh. get ice off bridges, to clear debris off the streets. Most of all, to restore power to the city of Montreal. Yeah, yeah, it has been so long without power for a lot of people. Okay, so this is like a brief, like, rest from the weather. So everyone's like scurrying around, desperately clamoring and working together, trying to clean up as much as they can because it's going to get colder again uh, soon. This was an uneasy calm after the storm. Downtown Montreal, much of it still without power, was turned into a massive pedestrian mall. Oh my gosh, look up the street. Like, the street is covered in a mountain of snow, but if you look further up, it's like 
the cars have probably been stuck there for a week like frozen in place some are sideways it's wild dozens of streets were closed too dangerous to pass ice huge chunks of it continued to rain down from yeah. above yeah despite the break in the weather life has not returned to normal far from it montrealers were told not to drink the tap water that prompted a rush on bottled water this store was cleaned out oh wow huh can't drink the tap water. I was just thinking, it's funny how these guys are chipping away at their car. This thing with their plastic <laughs> scraper. That'd be me with my little plastic scraper, just like banging on my car, kind of helpless. Like, oh, is this doing anything? This store was cleaned out. Even one of the proudest symbols of the city, hockey's Montreal Canadiens, couldn't escape the effects of the storm. Their game against New York tonight was postponed. Yeah. On the first day of relief from the onslaught of ice. <laughs> oh, that, that makes sense. It's funny that they, like, that's a very Canadian thing to me. For them to be like, th uh, ice is falling from the heavens, endangering people. We're all frozen in place. And there's going to be no hockey tonight. It's like, that. <laughs> you can see the priorities there. Against New York tonight was postponed. On the first day of relief from the onslaught of ice pellets, there was still shell shock from the ravages of the ice war. This yeah. looks like worse than any hurricane I've ever seen. I mean, the West Island, I thought, I thought where we are was pretty bad, but this is, this is incredible. This is devastation. Yeah. I was in Winnipeg yesterday. It's the first time in my life I wish I stayed in Winnipeg. When people start to venture out, inspecting the damage, and telling stories of another harrowing night. Every, everyone's has trees in their lawn. Like everyone, every road, trees down everywhere. That's like a major part of this. I can't believe it. This is the first time I've seen it. It's really sad. I feel bad for a lot of these people. You know, it's like a war zone, you know? It's just, I can't get over how bad it was. Yeah. And as the power crews begin to get back up, they also begin to get almost unbelievable estimates about outages. Yeah. Nearly 200,000 customers out in Vermont and northern New York. More than oh, okay, so we're talking about some of the American damage as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the amount of customers affected by this, like, insane. The amount of power towers, whatever they're actually called, that were collapsing, it was it just seemed like endless. And it rebuilding a tower or even a pole is not like a one-day thing, you know? Than a half million people out in Vermont and northern New York more than a half million people funny that even though they mentioned the American damage and stuff I still have never I'd never heard of the ice storm of 1998 till I checked out this little documentary despite it if like having a pretty major effect on some American communities Nimo says get this 99 percent of its customers are without power that's, that's <laughs> northern part of New York that, that's unbelievable I've never seen an, an ice storm of this nature yeah you go through the, the even the main streets forget about the back streets and the, uh, you see the trees and the power lines down and you just realize that this is something that's going to take quite some time to get over in yeah. Kingston, close to 75% of the area remains in the dark. That's because Ontario's Hydro's two main lines are down. Yeah. Good morning, an unprecedented step. I am. Well, yeah, weren't like five of the, it was four or five of the main power lines. I'm not talking about like a little cable. Like they made it sound like, I don't, I don't know how it works, but maybe this thing, uh, maybe there's a power cable like the size of a basketball or something that uh, they had to drop the log on to save. Like. Most of those were destroyed. I'm declaring, as of 10 a.m. this morning, a state of emergency in Ottawa, Carlton. Yeah. The scope of this disaster is hard to take in, especially in the area that took the biggest hit, Montreal's South Shore. No one has escaped. Nearly every household, every business is blacked out in a string of cities and towns that have become known as the Triangle of Darkness. You can see what happened. Triangle of Darkness. And right here, even small wires became like thick heavy what? cables of ice that is so insane it's like that shows you that's such a good example of the build-up how they were saying the build-up it was the build-up of the ice over the days like that cord is this tiny and it has like that much ice on it in some of the areas around here which is just south of montreal the whole distribution system has collapsed look at that and it could take weeks to get it back to normal 
we met up with this convoy of linemen who drove to the South Shore all the way from Long Island, New York. They okay. worked for a Connecticut-based power utility, and to our surprise, most were of French-Canadian heritage. I'm originally oh. stands at Quebec. And uh, what's your name, sir? Remy Perrault. Another another francophone. Yeah, we're working in down uh, New York right now, but we came huh. down. We came up here to help everybody. Nice. CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin and her camera operator were reporting on the storm on the outskirts of Montreal in an area that is particularly hard hit. Yeah. A hydro tower came crumbling to the ground. Wow, that's amazing they caught this on camera back in 1998. Like an actual tower falling down here. It's particularly hard hit. A hydro tower came crumbling to the ground, buckling under the staggering weight of the ice. The tower brought with it power lines attached yep. to the massive steel structure. The CTV yeah. crew was trapped, wires surrounding them on all sides. Whoa. They were trapped there for how long? Well, we were trapped there for several hours, actually. What? There was these massive high-tension wires around us, so we didn't know whether we could move at all. As we've heard, people are dying and collapsing Sheesh. from use of barbecues, propane, and other heaters inside their powerless oh, homes. And right, right, right. I was like, what? Because they're trying to use, like, alternative heat sources. <laughs> that would just, oh my gosh, that would be so horrible to, like, get through the storm and stuff and you're sitting in your home still freezing cold, but it's not, like, pouring ice outside anymore, but you're just stuck and you want a little heat and then you accidentally, like, get propane poisoning or whatever. They're ignoring warnings about touching wires or cutting what? trees down with the power out. Don't touch that. question of not Don't hearing the that. warning oh in the first gosh. place. 35 people died in this disaster and half a million people were forced from their homes. 35 people died. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. wow. First place. 35 people died in this disaster and half a million people were forced from their homes. Mm -hmm. In the end, it left five billion dollars in damage. Oh, oh yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm home. I have power. Oh, I feel really great to be home. Finally. Power. Progress. Emerging from darkness, the lights are coming back on. Yay. After what was quite literally the darkest weekend in Montreal's modern history, <laughs> yeah. at last there was light. By daybreak, power was back in the downtown core. Regular business was not. Downtown officials oh. said. Wow, I'm astounded they were able to do any kind of meaningful, like, restoration of power in any kind of short amount of time. That's pretty amazing. A lot of people coming together to like help out with that roof of the eaton center is in danger of collapsing under pressure from thick ice in montreal there had been an early report that the roof had collapsed and 100 people taking shelter in the complex had to evacuate electric utility workers from across north america the army and just about anyone who could lend a hand was trying to get the lights back on yeah and clean up the mess here we go one of the first things to do was to get rid of the tons of ice. There oh were some gosh. unique ways of doing it, like the team of police sharpshooters getting the ice off a communications antenna. Huh? What? I was like, yeah, that's unique. They're scraping it with a giant, like, bulldozer crane. And it's like, no, they were sniping the ice off a radio tower with, like, a gun. I mean... What works, works, I guess. Getting the ice off a communications antenna. Huh. In Montreal, most people will have electricity in a day or two. Here on the South Shore, hundreds of thousands of people will... That was, that was an American or something. They were like, <laughs> we're getting the ice off with chisels and cranes, and the American was like, hey, 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 I have a gun. I could shoot the ice off. <laughs> Stay in the dark for two more weeks. This crew is one of about 10 working in the area of Saint-Hyacinthe, a city with no power for a week. The men are working from 12 to 18 hours a day. The pylons are taking shape quickly. Cable lies waiting to be strung, but it takes time. Whoa, are they, they're actually like building new power lines and like actually putting new poles up. That's crazy. The lines here will not be up, the foreman says, before next week. If you can get them up in a week, that's amazing in my book. Like, everything is just trying to go, like, as quickly as possible. It's impressive. The lines here will not be up, the foreman says, before next week. And as temperatures plunge to minus 20, a major operation was underway to convince people without power to leave their homes. Oh. After about a week or so, eight days, 
I, I couldn't stay in my apartment anymore because it was way too cold. I realized when I stepped out of, out of the apartment, it was an old four-story building built in the 20s. The hallway was totally dark. Oh, I mean, are they worried it, c it could collapse because it's old? But also, like they were saying, he's been in his frozen apartment for like eight, nine days. So, I yeah, I guess some people would need, need convincing to leave their home, but it's also a matter of do they have somewhere to go? I realized that everybody was out of the building. I, I was the last one to leave. Huh. As night falls, the temperature drops. Wind chills tonight will hit minus 30. The wow. coldest since this crisis began more than a week ago. Yeah. Firewood and other supplies are pouring in from other parts of Quebec, Canada, and the United States. Nice. Uh, we're coming out of Richmond, Virginia, and we're bringing the beds and the tents for the people to sleep in. Okay, along with the Canadians helping out with this, it's good, it is good. Does me good, does me heart good to see some of the Americans helping as well. My dispatcher called me and said, well, we've got an emergency. We've got people up there in Canada that's sleeping outside in these beds. And I told him, I said, well, I'll be in. This storm is more than just freezing rain and downed power lines. It's also people coming together to help. Yes. Neighbors helping neighbors, people volunteering for countless hours in shelters. Yeah. And the kindness of strangers. Beautiful. The guy that came around the corner and hooked me back up to the electricity came in a truck that had a Massachusetts license plate on it. Uh -huh. And this kid looked like Adonis, he, <laughs> the Greek god of electricity hooking up, you know? I was never happier in my life. <laughs> and more signs things were getting back to normal. Schools started reopening. Did you enjoy your extended Christmas holiday? Oh my, what? <laughs> The kids are all like, yeah, we did. We did enjoy it. Did? Yeah. You enjoyed being yeah. home without power? Yeah. And everyone had a special story to tell about okay. his or her extra long vacation. Um, right. I had an oven stove. You so had an oven stove? Yeah. What's an oven stove? I made a wood stove. A wood stove. That is so funny. So these kids, I don't know how old these kids are right here. But right now, they could be like 35 or something. Uh, and have been in this little documentary saying how much fun they had during the worst natural disaster in Canadian history. Stop. In the fridge, some of our things went bad, but we're still okay, and my mom now is like going for groceries today. You wonder exactly how we survived that devastating ice storm of 98? Just look to your neighbors. Every A big thank you to the fire department uh, workers, ice storm, uh, yeah, that's very nice. They are, they're, they're absolutely spot on here. This is how a lot of people, like, actually got through this. Everybody was in it together. You were without power, so were 20,000 other people right around us, and didn't have it any worse than anybody else, but you yeah. helped your neighbor, and your neighbor yeah. helped you. Adversity, somehow, has brought out the best in people. I think it's everybody's working together and enjoying it. It's made people far more human and realize that what we can do for each other. <laughs> A little laugh. I'm glad they're having this, like, uh, touching little happy ending. Uh, I'm sure it was not, like, the Cinderella story fairy tale happy ending, actually, for, like, a lot of people. But in general, I, I shouldn't say that because uh, the documentary here is doing a good job. It does It does me good to see, like, them focusing on the community effort here and, like, ending on a positive note on the outcome of this whole thing. It's good. It's good. Therapy to lighten things up. Considering uh, the time that uh, we're all facing right now, it's been very stressful for our family and for a lot of people around here, so it's definitely very uplifting. Show you that people care, you yeah. know? They really do care. I, I've actually have been helping out today, so it's, it's like, given me something to do. Now, could I judge by your accent that you may have never have seen anything like this before? No, we're from England, so yeah. we've only been here a year, so we're still coping with the Canadian weather, <laughs> let alone this. So. But, well, you only see this once in a lifetime, they say, yes. such as this. <laughs> oh my gosh, of all, of all the years, of all the years you could have moved from the UK to Canada, you chose 1998. Unlucky. Yes. What were some of the lessons learned from this? You mentioned generators. I think a lot more Be people prepared. and farms have generators now. Well, there are probably lessons learned 
but it's going to be so long yeah. before something like this happens again, we'll probably have to learn all over again. Right. Mother Nature. I, like a lot of places just as like a rule of thumb, have backup generators now. Like as time goes on, technology will go on and people have more access to power and backups and backups. So, yeah. Although, like they said, this only happens once every 100 years. But that means it could happen in like 75 years. She reminded us that she can still wreak havoc with our high-tech modern way of life with almost no warning in a way we almost never expected. We also learned that here in Quebec, more people heat with electricity than in just about any other part of the world. Huh. But what we should really remember is how much we depended on our friends and our neighbors, on strangers from nearby and from far away. Yeah. You know, from a meteorologist's point of view, this was certainly the most interesting thing I've ever seen. I mean, it was it was mind-boggling what was going on. As far as I That's me. That's me. I'm the meteorologist guy. I'm like, from a scientific point of view, this is fascinating stuff. But it's horrible. It's terrible and hurt a lot of people. I'm concerned. But it's fascinating. It's definitely the biggest weather-related thing I've ever covered in my life. And no doubt, most of us who live through it will never forget the ice storm of 98. Yeah. 1997 was said to be the warmest year on record, in fact, since <laughs> records were kept at all. A lot of folks think that uh, the ice storm in 98 was a once-in-a-lifetime event, but the reality is it will happen again. Milder winters may mean the conditions to create the perfect ice storm could be just around the corner. Huh? Whoa, whoa, I thought this was getting all happy. We were having a good time. Everybody, it was very touching. Why do they have to go and do this? Why do they have to end it this way? Another one could be just around the corner. It's a good lesson though, obviously. It is actually an important lesson. Is that it? Montreal's one to watch. See ya. Ooh. Okay. No, that's it. <laughs> it's like, what is that? Okay. Wow. Wow. Good stuff. Um, horrible stuff, but good stuff. Yeah, like I said, like I've been saying, I had never heard of this, this event at all. So getting to learn about this for like the last couple days, honestly, has been something. It's been an experience. I felt like, felt like I was there. No, I couldn't. Honestly, I haven't. I can't say that. But uh, I feel like I understand somewhat what they went through. And this was by Discover Montreal, by the way. And I liked it. I got to give this a like. Wow, wow, wow. You know what? Uh, you know what else I have here? A, uh, a viewer, a viewer of the channel uh, sent me... Uh, David, thank you, by the way, for sending me this, um, this PDF from a Canadian article, basically, talking about some of the stats of the ice storm of 98, I thought was interesting. So I thought this was worth uh, looking at for a second. Over 18% of Canada's population, including 56% of Quebec's and 11% of Ontario's, were affected by the storm. 18% of Canada's population, one out of five people, basically, in Canada, were affected by the storm. Insane. A thousand power transmission towers were toppled down. 30,000 wooden utility poles were brought down. This is why the whole time during this video I was saying, this is going to take for The aftermath is going to be taking forever to fix this. So, I mean... Some of the damage might still be, like, uh, seen today, right? At the height of the storm, 1.4 million customers were out ele without electricity. Oh, 100,000 people taking refuge in shelters. Amazing, helping 100,000 people get to shelters. 16,000 armed force personnel assisted with emergency measures and the restoration of the power grid. Largest peacetime deployment of Canadian troops ever. Amazing. Very nice to hear. Um, oh, what else we have here? Uh, $10 million raised by mid-February 1998 for the Canadian Red Cross Ice Storm Relief Fund. Cool. Amazing. Oh, and we had some stats here about the aftermath. 
Yeah, so we're at the end here. We've experienced what happened. And in the aftermath, 57% of urban areas in Quebec, 15% in Ontario, accounting for 19% of Canada's total urban space, were subjected to the storm. It's a lot. Um, almost five, This was interesting. Almost 5 million sugar maple taps in Quebec, 23% of them. And uh, and twenty five percent of the ones in Ontario were located in the affected areas. That's in the first part. I think we saw that uh, maple sap harvesting a company who was getting hit by the storm, and their maple trees were getting destroyed. Five million sugar maple taps were affected by this. Quebec's maple syrup producers account for seventy percent of the world's supply. Yeah. So that just completely decimated, like, some of the maple syrup producers, basically. Some of them, a lot of them seem like family kind of run companies, which is very sad. Oh, it could take 30 to 40 years before production in eastern Ontario is back to normal. Still not back to normal to this day. Nearly one quarter of all dairy cows were located in the affected area. Dairy farms are thoroughly dependent on mechanized milking. Not cows that are not milked regularly become vulnerable to mastitis? Infection, infection of the udder? Dairy cows that survive the power outages may never attain their pre-storm level of productivity. That's... Talk about a random fact. The poor cows even were affected by this. Milk processing plants... <laughs> milk processing plants shut down. Over 10 million liters of milk dumped? Jeez, probably frozen solid. Um... As of June 1998, 1 billion in insurance claims filed by Canadian households. Yeah, I mean, all this just reinforcing how many people this affected, basically. Anyway, interesting stuff here, I found. I found this whole story to be uh, quite enlightening. Quite, uh, quite good for me to learn about this. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed this very much. Anyway, uh, if you enjoyed this as well, this video, this reaction, feel free to give it a like or leave a comment. And if you're interested in more videos like this, me reacting to Canada, Canadian culture, stuff in Canada that I've never seen before, feel free to subscribe for more. And until then, thanks for watching and see you next time.